Britain world. To the Christian Milton, Satan was superficially a deceiver, a fraud, and a trickster. But then, the trickster archetype is as old as fiction itself. So then, did the figure of Satan have a predecessor in the Western canon? Put simply, many. But the most direct source for Milton's conception of Satan as written into Paradise Lost is that of the gargantuan ancient Greek figure of Prometheus, the Firebringer. In his introduction to Prometheus Bound, Richard Lattimore writes, The startling fact about Prometheus Bound is the cruel, almost villainous part played by Zeus. Although he never appears, his motives seem plain, and they are those of a tyrant. This idea is constantly repeated and reinforced throughout the work, as on page 77, that helped set up his tyranny, and again on page 78, the sovereign tyranny of Zeus. We first meet this astonishing figure in the works of Aeschylus in Medius Res, in the midst of his punishment for disobeying God. He is chained to the rocky face of a crag somewhere in the Caucasus to suffer for his revolt. And what is his crime? The bringing of fire to humankind, stolen from Zeus, the heat and light of which will kindle knowledge, progress and civilization against the wishes of the High God, who wants to keep them in a state of benighted ignorance and servility, precisely as does the Biblical God. Prometheus says, It was mortal man to whom I gave great privileges, and for that was yoked in this unyielding harness. I hunted out the secret spring of fire, which when revealed became a teacher of each craft to men, a great resource. This is a sin I committed for which I stand accountant, and I pay nailed in my chains under an open sky. Then on page 75, Prometheus says, Besides, I myself gave them fire, and from it they shall learn many crafts. And then on page 83, in one short sentence understand it all, every art of mankind comes from Prometheus. The words that Aeschylus uses in these anglicized passages to describe the gift he gave to human beings are, according to the translation, craft and art. These words, when rendered into the original Greek, are actually the same word. Thus, craft and art were used as separate words when transcribed into the English. However, the original Greek designation in Aeschylus's work for both of these words is technas or techne. This word can mean craft and art, but it can also mean cunning or wiles. However, this is only part of the story. Techne is a word that in ancient Greek life was closely associated with another word, episteme, which means knowledge, science, or understanding. The difference between them is that the latter, episteme, is akin to theoretical or abstract knowledge, whereas the former, techne, is practical or applied knowledge. We may even call it knowledge at work. For the ancient Greeks, both of these were types of knowledge, as for example the English word science, which we derive from the Latin scientia, denotes a specific type of knowledge that is based on empiricism, reproducibility and falsifiability. Techne and episteme are essentially therefore, although divergent strands, nonetheless types of knowledge. So what Prometheus gave to mankind was in fact knowledge. And Milton's Satan, what did he give to human beings? Knowledge. This much is irrefutable. The cultural and therefore value changes from ancient Greece to Christianity is what accounts for the difference in emphasis placed on these different types of knowledge. The Grecian stressing mastery and artistry, the Christian focusing on morality of a kind. And in both cases, the gods cried, thou shalt not, and the humanists, thou shalt. Both of these gigantic figures were teachers, illuminators, who opened human eyes and gave them consciousness. Satan, and do they only stand by ignorance, invented with design to keep them low, whom knowledge might exalt with gods? Prometheus, how I found them witless and gave them minds, made them masters of their wits. 
To further clarify these seemingly coincidental similarities in the Prometheus myth, in the version originally attributed to Apollodorus, human beings are molded out of clay, as is the case in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 of the Bible. Indeed, this myth occurs throughout several religions and is in no way unique to Christianity. Exploring this idea of theological, intellectual copyright infringement just a few strata deeper, one notices that in Paradise Lost, Milton writes of heaven's afflicting thunder and had Satan describe God as he whom thunder hath made greater. Zeus, it is no secret, is the god of thunder. In fact, to be even more precise, Zeus is the god of the sky, thunder, law and order, and eternal fire. The facts speak for themselves. It takes a certain ingenuity of delusion to deny these obvious similarities, if similarities is what we are feeling kind enough to call them. The vast parallels between Milton's Satan and Aeschylus's as well as other renditions of Prometheus are far too numerous to be discounted as insignificant. These are correspondences whose lineage is palpably explicit and clear enough to repudiate the unimaginative and starkly irrational claim that these cognates are mere correlations, that is to say, coincidences, and not bound together in an obvious causal relationship. In other words, Milton's Satan was not created ex nihilo, but is in a very real sense an excavation of both the ancient Greek Prometheus and the biblical Satan, a direct plagiarism of the grand figure of Prometheus himself. The biblical figure of Satan is an example of an actual and far-reaching cultural appropriation in the truest sense of the word, not as applied by the woke mindset, but applied as demanded by logic, and moreover, an inversion of the original, except that where Prometheus was seen to be the defender and advocate of mankind, that is to say, the grand humanist, the biblical, and consequently Milton's Satan has been cleverly stigmatized and associated with alarm, dusk and fear, stifling serious interrogation and criticism as to this figure's incredible achievements and noblest of motives. So, to this end, here is a necessary question for the faithful audience. What could pose a greater threat to humanity, to ethics, to democracy and to freedom itself than the inversion of tyrants into hallowed leaders and of humanist rebels into despised figures, so that even the questions surrounding their legitimacies are so heavily colored with taboo that millennia are able to pass with none or painfully few willing to challenge and to be sure repudiate these ideas, these undignified assumptions. More than a century after Milton's death, in his essay of 1784, what is enlightenment, Immanuel Kant wrote that sapere alde, which translates as dare to know, or perhaps more closely, dare to be wise, was the very motto of the enlightenment itself. And on this timeless question, as if sensing the tremors of the great age to come, Milton's giant and high humanist Satan declares, for good unknown sure is not had, or had and yet unknown is as not had at all. In plain then, what forbids he but to know? Forbids us good, forbids us to be wise. The written world, life lessons from literature.